There is in all things a pattern that is part of our universe. It has symmetry, elegance, and grace, those qualities you find always in that which the true artist captures. You can find it in the turning of the seasons, in the way sand trails along a ridge, in the branch clusters of the creosote bush, or the pattern of its leaves. We try to copy these patterns in our lives and our society, seeking the rhythms, the dances, the forms that comfort. Yet it is possible to see peril in the finding of ultimate perfection. It is clear that the ultimate pattern contains its own fixity. In such perfection, all things move toward death. That was from Dune, from Frank Herbert. And I started talking about the danger of perfection in the fountain when you wrote something about how the space traveler story, he's advanced so much that he can live for thousands of years and be at this Zen oneness state and travel across the galaxy, but he can't accept the reality of death, mm -hmm. which is like a very simple thing that he's got wrong, even though he has everything else perfect. Uh, he has a perfect life in the present day plot as a neuroscientist. Their house is beautiful. He's got a great career. Um, it seems like also the, the movie itself has achieved an ultimate pattern. Mm -hmm. Every single scene is this beautiful uh, tree of life cross. Mm -hmm. There's crosses everywhere and uh, stars hanging in space in every scene. Um, but it's, it's too perfect. Mm -hmm. Or like the error is that he is infatuated with the perfect the perfection mm -hmm. the, st the story's hero the movie's only an hour and a half and it's it's really dense mm -hmm. really powerful and I think partly it is because like there's only one thing wrong and everything else is beautiful yeah there's only one thing wrong mm -hmm. and for the medium of cinema, um, you, you are trying to boil it down like that mm. to some to that simple of a conflict, so that you can experience a whole arc within a movie's length. Mm. Yeah, good point. Um, well, we. This is your second time watching The Fountain. Mm -hmm. And well, do you basically like it more as a film now? Or did you yeah. kind of already like it the same? You already knew it was good. I already knew it was good, but I think the first time I watched it, I was really, uh, yeah, like had a disturbance about like, death aspect to it like n not the moment when he reaches Shibaba and and the tree and accepts it but yeah. like yeah. more the moment where Rachel Weiss's character Izzy is like um, you know what do you think about death as a creative action and then like the sunlight is falling on her and she has this like cherubic like pure innocent face and it looks like it's almost like disturbing how like perfectly good she appears like and she's talking about death and it just struck me as like so you know where does this lead us like if if that is like mm -hmm. your image of like pure goodness and wisdom and understanding like mm -hmm. this seems like like worship of death. Mm -hmm. um, but this time, like I still had kind of that 
odd feeling at that exact scene, but mostly I was seeing um, the way that, yeah, there's this really necessary acceptance of endings. Like the first time that I watched the film, I didn't catch the significance of her line at the beginning. She just kind of whispers, end it. And then the, the movie starts. Mm-hmm. And so, like, watching it again, um, I could really feel the power of starting with that and the mm-hmm. significance of, like, this director and his creative process and the necessity to, like, bring a story to completion. Mm-hmm. And I think so often when we're writing, like, I like to stay in that place of being in the middle of the piece I'm working on because mm-hmm. I want it to be perfect and I don't want to lose, like, all the possibilities that come with being in process. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not until the piece is, like, completed and pushed out that... Um, you actually get to like go back and reread it and mm-hmm, yeah. experience that magic of it. There's a there's a middle path to it because I'm remembering how we were just talking outside about how the treasure is very much the hunt itself mm-hmm. and being in the adventure of your life is the real fruit of experience Mm -hmm. more than the destination or the treasure you're finding. Mm -hmm. But they're complementary. That's the middle path aspect of it. If you're overly attached to being a seeker and being Mm -hmm. out in the jungle, you will never bring the fruits back to civilization. Right, yeah. And you, you do have to, like, follow the whole arc and find the thing and call your adventure to a close, bring that treasure back, and um, accept that that part of the story is over now. Mm -hmm. And that is, allowing that whole arc to happen is what allows you to reread it, Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, is there something uh, off in mother there is there a dysfunctional creator who like can't call it because there's this like infinite recurrence in the movie mother where he's not he's experienced the uh, experiencing the creative arc infinitely yeah but it's like destructive every time did you see my response to this in the write-up well, just say it out loud again. <laughs> I don't remember. I was kind of thinking about that and going, like, maybe he has returned to his own work, The Fountain, and sees the way that, like, his creative process has a lot to do with that death aspect. And so then he, like... And also, you know, maybe there's something about, like, feeling like the fountain is like his greatest work but maybe it isn't regarded as such yeah maybe it's his most sincere work yeah but it's not maybe regarded that way and so with mother he's almost like you know taking it to like the death cult like grotesque extreme and like um (laughs) self-flagellating I, I kind of think he's having a temper tantrum with Mother. Like, people didn't give him the credit that he thought he deserved with his previous films. So he made yeah, a... Yeah, you said that, yeah. So he made a temper tantrum out of Mother <laughs> and revealed this disgust he has for his audience. Like, all you want is to be titillated by, like, gruesome death cult stuff. Like, everyone talks about Black Swan and Requiem for a Dream. No one talks about the fountain. Mm. So the next time I'm in a fountain kind of mood, which was Mother, he then, yeah, just, like, made it this statement about how 
humans are just gross and just want to look at the grotesqueness of it. Mm-hmm. And anyway, the more exciting thing is about the chance to get outside of your art once it's finished so you can reread it because you had a bunch of stuff from Wordsworth to bring up. Yeah. Um, what was this in response to? Well, the the movie got reframed by you by yeah. noticing Rachel Weisz saying, finish it at yeah. the very front of the film. Yeah, and so I was struck by, like, I was myself rereading the film and then watching Tommy's character reread his life and kind of... Um, He's on this massive hero's journey, and he doesn't really get to be a hero until he reaches Shabalba. And part of getting there is like reimagining the other stories to do something better. But yeah, he's he's returning through his memories to those moments and like Mm -hmm. finding more peace with existence. And, um, yeah, that's, like, an inherently romantic theme. So the Wordsworth lines I was going to read to start are um, first from Tintern Abbey, which is word, which is probably Wordsworth's most famous poem. Mm-hmm. And um, it starts, Five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters. And again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a sweet inland murmur. Once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs? And he goes on to describe um, this place he was five years ago and kind of specifically talking about the change in the place and the change in himself. And um, yeah, I just love that line, again I hear, and that Mm -hmm. is what's happening to Tommy. Again, I hear her voice saying, finish it. Yeah. And um, so it's just cool to catch this aspect of romanticism in a movie that I immediately notice more like your your interest in romanticism with just like heroic action and striving toward ideal. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's nice to remember that it happens by this means of rereading one's experience. Mm -hmm. And okay, so I have a few more Wordsworth lines to share. Um, He has an essay called What is a Poet? And he says, um, he describes a few things and then he says, to these qualities he has added a disposition to be affected more than other men by absent things as if they were present. And The poet has a disposition Mm -hmm. to react to things that are absent. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, the the interior state and the reflective state present there. And finally, um, in the poem, I wandered lonely as a cloud. (laughs) Um, The final stanza goes, For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. And um, this is the end of the poem, but it would nicely flow right back into the beginning and you could read the whole thing over that way. Mm-hmm. Um, which is the ref- a reflection. Yeah, of, of taking this walk and like observing nature. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and that's cyclical experience with reality and with writing and I intuited that immediately with this film when I first saw it in theaters um, and became that it became my favorite film for a lot of years Mm. and I watched it a zillion times Mm. because it well it required rereading and um it's cyclical nature it gives you in any number of different ways to enter it as an audience member. Yeah, totally. And it like the movie starts 
with Spanish conquistadors. So the first time you watch it, you're watching this adventure fantasy film. Mm -hmm. And then it it becomes also a love story about a present-day neuroscientist doctor and his dying wife. And it's got this sci-fi spiritual uh, God consciousness aspect in the space traveler plot. Mm -hmm. But um, the first time you watch it, you don't catch on that it's that it's endlessly rereading itself Mm -hmm. and it's just repeating different themes to itself Mm -hmm. over the course of the film Mm -hmm. like Rachel Weisz saying finish it Mm -hmm. but two different layers of the hero the space traveler or the conquistador or the neuroscientist or um, together we will live forever Mm -hmm. she'll come in and say that two different parts of his personality at different times and so it's a much different impact Mm -hmm. every time she says it yeah Uh, my sister called it when i first watched it a movie about simultaneous time as if simultaneous time was this like term yogis (laughs) people say yeah Yeah. (laughs) like yogis are familiar with this state or something (laughs) Mm -hmm. um but a, a state where butterfly effect maybe like doing one thing mm-hmm. advances five other people's stories right. and then they do something that advances your story mm-hmm. and I just couldn't believe my like eyes when I was 18 and watched this movie that he was able to achieve something so like densely hyperlinked inside itself mm. and um i just knew i would understand it more the more i watched it sure yeah yeah that uh simultaneous time thing i have one of my questions is uh if i was hosting a dinner party and this film was my guest uh, who would I seat next to them? <laughs> and like what cultural object would mm-hmm. you put next to them yeah. at the dinner party? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, now I feel like, oh my God, I should have thought about this longer. But um, the film Magnolia has that simultaneous time thing going on. And now I really, yeah, I wish I had more. <laughs> references for that specific thing because it's like the coolest yeah it is the coolest thing i mean i guess like i almost want to say like lord of the rings does that because you're following like a bunch of different parties working on their own separate projects that are like leading toward the same end it does and it matters that they all like hit the thing at the right moment so that that can like all come together there is harmony yeah and tolkien is showing the divine harmony that spontaneously occurs when everyone's focused on a transcendent ideal. Totally. And there is a nested thing to it, too, Mm -hmm. where uh, Frodo is the space traveler guy, Mm -hmm. where, like, he's alone with the choice of existence. Totally. Or the choice towards death. And only he can make this decision for the rest of the world but like he can't move forward unless Aragorn is ascending to the kingship Mm -hmm. and like like everyone has to make the yes decision about life yes and the the fact that everyone has been making that choice Mm -hmm. like clears the way for Frodo when he's finally ready to make that choice yeah um, that's amazing. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> we love Lord of the Rings. Did not expect Lord of the Rings Sorry. to come in to Had to do it. Everything. Um, <laughs> so you would at the dinner party you would put Lord of the Rings next to the fountain. <laughs> Wasn't well, my original plan. Well I was gonna say, just in terms of treasure hunt themes, um, Aguere Wrath of God has the conquistador aspect present that's like 
totally out of touch with like laws of nature such as death like um so so focused on his mission that he can't achieve it wow yeah um yeah and so that's like like he he would only be talking to that like conquistador aspect of the tommy character while like Mm -hmm. the other tommy characters would be like talking to other people um and then yeah in that same spirit of treasure hunt and south america um embrace of the serpent was the other like film that i would add to the Mm -hmm. table um the the conquistador we were thinking of what one scene we could describe in the film Mm -hmm. and you were picking the the scene that starts the moment the conquistador's story ends Mm -hmm. and so the conquistador makes it all the way to the temple that's hiding the tree of life Mm -hmm. and he's stopped there the entire film Mm -hmm. he's stuck there facing his own death yeah the entire film and that's why rachel weiss is saying finish it finish the story because no one can finish the story once rachel weiss is dead except tommy himself Mm -hmm. um and she sets it up so beautifully where like the final word is um all he could see was death yeah yes and then chapter 12 like yes, now and you have to carry it forward after this point which he can't yes. even get over like that word and it's so death. it's so heartbreaking yeah like that scene is the neuroscientist has lost his wife yeah and he finally opens the book to see what happens next mm-hmm. and all he could see was death chapter 12 blank pages yeah and I think that's the same moment where he starts tattooing himself mm-hmm. as his mourning yeah. process. Yeah, like he's supposed to grab the pen and write it down, but instead he starts like... Self-flagellating. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is, your, this is the scene we're picking to describe is where the other parts of the story clear the way for the conquistador. The... Space Traveler finally accepts death. And so when the Conquistador is about to be chopped down by the Mayan guard, Mm -hmm. the Mayan guard sees the god consciousness of the Mm -hmm. Space Traveler and kneels to him Mm -hmm. and prostrates himself Mm -hmm. and lets the Conquistador pass. Mm -hmm. And the Conquistador finds the Tree of Life, uh completes his journey Mm -hmm. which is to be so focused on the conquest that the tree of life basically eats him alive Mm -hmm. and the ring he took from spain from his queen Mm -hmm. across the world into the jungle to the top of this pyramid is now just alone next to a tree and some grass Mm -hmm. and no one's there and that's where the scene starts and maybe you can tell the rest and why you like it yeah the the ring um then goes to like tommy space traveler yes and he finally gets the ring which went missing when his wife died because he was like so focused on curing the disease of death that he wasn't focused on like the present moment of being with her And so it's in this returning um, to the beginning, to the story, and the um, conquistador, the tree of life moment that he gets to have a ring back. And so that is like, um, he, he is with the tree of life the whole time, but the treasure to get from that temple is actually the ring, the wedding ring. Wow, yeah. Yeah. And that's so beautiful. And I said that night when we were watching it of like, well, he lost the ring because he was defaulting on his marriage vows. Yeah. There was some like principle underneath 
the written word of their marriage vows that I am going to say yes to experience Mm -hmm. and I'll be assured that you're next to me Mm -hmm. because you're also saying yes to experience. Mm -hmm. And so Rachel Weiss said yes to her early death, but he didn't. And so he lost the ring Mm. for all those millennia until he was able to um, finally reread it enough times that he was able to do the emotional processing necessary to be able to continue the marriage contract yeah of going with the flow of life Mm -hmm. um yeah so the like actual treasure moment maybe of the whole movie is just that like very romantic scene of them in the bathtub and like you just can suddenly see like how in love they are yes and um there's something about like weird timeline things like this that can really like highlight a like soulmate type plot line and um so my other dinner guest thing that i remember that's so silly is um the time traveler's wife which is like i have to say like not a good movie like (laughs) in any way but it but it like it's kind of like the like young adolescent that like needs to needs to meet this sure. thing to look up to. Totally. And it's like um, the I guess the thing to say about that movie is the time traveler. He's like uh, out of control of the fact that he's like uh, moving through time he's at the will of of that Uh and um so he just kind of gets plopped into different situations and he doesn't kind of know exactly where he is when he might be meeting someone like is this the first time we met is this Mm -hmm. the last you know Mm -hmm. and um so when he meets his wife like she's already known him for years but it's the first time that he meets her Mm -hmm. and um it's so silly to talk about this movie, but I guess like her basic spirit in that is like she, he, he is like flipping through time, but she is like recognizing fate and she's yes. like grounded in that way. Yeah. And, um, but like, I think I'm trying to say Rachel Weiss's character is also grounded similarly. Like she's not fighting against time she's like in touch with fate and like like being the maori like Mm -hmm. um figure in in a way that's like really beautiful and she's the in the mayan uh myth she tells is that the first father sacrifices himself by becoming the world tree Mm -hmm. and the tree grows out of his body and makes all life possible and so she intuitively understands that the way she approaches her death makes all of life possible Mm -hmm. and I talk in the write-up about how Aronofsky's love of film is allowed to just be here without like overwhelming ugliness Mm -hmm. because there's this goddess of goodness present in the movie Mm. yeah and all his other movies have the same love of physicality Mm -hmm. and really physical edits Mm -hmm. that like give you this tactile feeling of the sets and of the people's faces this amazing intimacy um you can tell he loves what he's doing darren aronofsky but this is the only movie that just like lets the love come out on top Mm -hmm. instead of making it so dark and gruesome and Mm -hmm. brutal yeah and it's because there's a character planted in that yeah as a as a worldview in the movie yeah that makes me think um like in Mother, 
he like destroys the possibility for that like the um like the opportunity of telling a Christ story is pointing out the fact that Mary like knows that a tragic fate will happen and like says yes to life anyway and she's like this existential yes and sees the goodness in being like even in spite of sorrow Mm -hmm. um and she makes so much life mm -hmm. in the world possible yeah by that but um he doesn't create the opportunity to show that part of like the beauty in jennifer lawrence's performance yeah so he kind of like strips mother of like her divinity um without even like like aside from all the terrible things that happened to her like he just doesn't even give the opportunity for like that part to be expressed yeah the way ayn rand has every character give a manifesto mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah um uh jennifer lawrence never had a chance to give her manifesto in yeah. the film like her worldview mm -hmm. did not play a, yeah. a meaningful role in the plot. Right. And so it, so it's an incomplete plot. Yeah. If the star of the movie isn't allowed to yeah. uh, evoke her basic way of viewing the world. Yeah. Um, I was thinking while you're talking about Mother, about Black Swan, um, like Natalie Portman doesn't accept her own death thing that mm -hmm. makes true achievement possible. Like, she's clinging to perfection herself the entire yeah. film. And she moves toward death. <laughs> <laughs> and I've protest in film desks before, I've protested against... And then the, all the characters die <laughs> yeah. as, like, this basic fucking plot device mm -hmm. that's just really boring um and tragic like pointlessly tragic right. i think like we have as a culture have gotten really uh um, pessimistic mm -hmm. and like have had some like generation x conceit that that makes us cool right to be pessimistic mm -hmm. and so we don't argue with movies that end with the hero dying tragically. But it is also a reflection of the medium of the film, too. This is the point I've come to before, is psychologically, mm -hmm. the characters die yeah. when you leave the theater. Yeah, edit in the clip of you saying that in Dead Man Pod. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, it adheres to the cinema, the experience of cinema mm -hmm. to have the characters die, but. Our revels now are ended. Yes, but it doesn't, like, it prevents you from integrating the value of the film into your own life because you take away the message that. Uh, these revels end in death, so you shouldn't really, like, be heroic like this. Mm. So there's there's a delicate, there's a very delicate balance there yeah. about accepting death, but, like, life is not about worshiping death. Yeah, that I was wanting to bring that up from our conversation outside. Like, the idea that your friend Anne Rand points out in Alice Shrugged is that like um, like a lot of people don't really want to be alive at all and yeah a will toward non-being and so I guess the point there is like this movie is only for people that aren't struggling with that problem like it's only appropriate if, like, you're already pretty far along with, like, a full yes to being. Um, the fountain? Mm hmm Well, it... I think it can be really helpful. It can 
to someone who's on the fence it can show you what's at stake mm. like while you're on the fence the tree of life is slowly being tortured to death mm. while you dither over like whether over which choice you should make mm. I'm looking at our list of prompts um, is this film adding anything new to culture oh do you want to talk about the Ellen Burstein thing well, you you go about culture and then move to Ellen Burstein. Yeah. I was going to put the question to you. Okay. Is this film adding <laughs> anything new to culture? Um, I, I think so, just because I feel like I haven't seen something quite like this before. Yeah, um, me neither. The beauty of each scene is like alone that's like <laughs> really good um well it's so beautiful it hasn't even been effectively upgraded forget 4k this movie hasn't even gotten a good hd mm -hmm. uh edit yet and like half of it was super fuzzy while we were watching mm -hmm. it and it was still like it's obviously one of the more beautiful films yeah like Every frame could be a painting. Um, I think that's something that is missing from culture for me. Like, we've done a pretty good job, and I think it's important to see movies that, like, take your everyday street and turn that into a place where magical things happen. Mm -hmm. But it's even more wonderful, or equally wonderful, I don't know, to see, like, you know, ideal places, like the most beautiful bedroom you've ever seen, the most beautiful hospital you can imagine. That's right, it was the most yeah. beautiful hospital yeah. <laughs> I've ever seen in the fountain. Yeah. I think it's more important than those beautiful scenes of Agnes Varda films of just daily life because you set these standards with movies like The Fountain of how should I design a hospital? Well, here's a contemplation of the most beautiful hospital. Mm -hmm. Like, how should a room look? Yeah. Like, well, here's a contemplation of one person making the most beautiful bedroom he could on yeah. film. And then that informs the planning of cities, mm -hmm. which then would make a more beautiful mm -hmm. city, Yeah. which then would allow someone like Agnes Varda to film the magic happening in yeah, that city. that's right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. So it's completely necessary yeah. to have pieces yeah. like this that just try to develop the mm -hmm. beauty. That makes me see that, like, um, yeah, a director can kind of um, also steal the opportunities of, like, an architect or something. He can dream the dreams of an architect in terms of like what physical places should look like mm -hmm. um he can start to manifest those and at least begin to suggest them and suggest what physical culture looks like before the creators of physical culture have like fully gotten there maybe right that's cool well that's the reflection and the rereading mm -hmm. that artists get to do mm -hmm. so that people who can't be bothered with the reflection they're just warrior mode mm -hmm. in physicality yeah uh they don't have time to reflect like that mm -hmm. but if other people are doing that for them yeah. then they have these references to use mm -hmm. yeah um what else has it done for culture um i think I don't know how this movie compares to like other films made around this time or something. I don't think I have a great wealth of information about all this, but um, I feel like it's a rare movie where like the soulmate thing feels really like beautiful and like um, I'm on board rather than like mm -hmm. a little cliche. Mm -hmm. um, which reminds me, another guest to add to my list is uh, What Dreams May Come. 
and that's another soulmate movie and I love that movie but it is a little cheesier I don't think it's as visually beautiful um, it's just not as like tight and and like specific as yes. the fountain the fountain has its own story and what dreams may come is like a little more universal yes you know the fountain is incredibly tight it's hour and a half and it mm -hmm. manages to say it by being concise and self-contained, it appears to say something about all of existence. Yeah. Like, that's the impression it gives off. Yeah. Um, and it achieves the, the really potent, authentic soulmate dynamic just by those close-ups on the faces. Mm. Like, maybe those are... Yeah, it's like focusing on intimacy. Yes. Yeah, that's cool. And you are the lover contemplating. Yeah, how beautiful she looks in yes. the throne room. Yeah, totally. Yes. Mm. And you just, the director just lets you fill the whole screen yeah. with that face. Okay, so here's another just like visual thing. The moments of like zooming in on him, like whispering to her, like very intimately in bed or something. And it's like, the curve of her neck and like her like the delicate like you know light hair on her neck and then he leans into the tree and whispers to the tree in and the kind same of the way. hair on the tree like stands on end in the same way and um yeah and just the visual similarity between those moments she like is the tree of life for him that's right yeah yeah she is the tree of life and they imply that he literally found a seed of the tree of life and mm -hmm. planted it over his wife's corpse. And that's the tree he's using in the spaceship mm. to go there. I got the impression that it was more like uh, he took the one tree from the temple for his spaceship and what he planted over his wife's grave is just that little like pokey ball that she like picked off a tree and that was more like a symbol yeah well either way it is <laughs> obvious that yeah the tree yeah. of life is his intimate lover yeah and the spaceship thing but i think the point i'm trying to make is like until he comes to terms with death and the cyclical nature of life, the like she is his connection to that and like mm -hmm. the inspiring force for him. Mm -hmm. And like the tree's dying by the time he, you know, mm -hmm. has it like that. And mm -hmm. yeah. this is a more rant uh, off thought, but. Friction Wheel is the song I wrote is like an attempt to write a script such that the the hero in this movie can accept the cyclical nature mm. and the death. Mm -hmm. Like, why should you? And then Friction Wheel is a little story of like, oh, that's cool. this is why you should. Oh, yeah. And it's natural to feel yearning and distance mm -hmm. and but like you have to accept it too because you get so much out of the friction of that mm. and so there's a way in which the fountain space traveler guy tattooing himself is like him slowly growing tree rings oh that's cool and like yeah he's he is is slowly like each ring is a, is a friction wheel cycle that's allowing him to like warm up to the idea mm -hmm. of this cycle of life and death. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I feel like pretty complete. No, there's a few. You want to tell me about Ellen Bur Burstyn. Yeah. Um, I want to say if it's a good movie to watch on a first date and you got to say, did someone have to be stupid to move this plot forward? 
Okay, well, I don't really care about that one. No? No you, one. You put it in there. No one had to be stupid to move this plot forward. Okay. It's a great movie. <laughs> um, I think this yeah, would be a terrible well. movie to watch on the first date. <laughs> I don't even think it's a very... I'm, I think if you watch it within the first year of a relationship, you're probably playing with fire. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah. And... So then I guess if you did choose to watch it on a first date, that would be like kind of hilarious and crazy, but I, yeah, I wouldn't do that. Too heavy. Yeah. Maybe start with the time traveler's wife, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, be, just avoid be... this subject entirely, <laughs> I would suggest. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, what do I think? Is it a good one on any date? It's just really intense. It's really heavy. Yeah, maybe one shouldn't watch it till they're like married to the person <laughs> or something. But that's even heavier because it's about these this married couple that is like getting separated. But you know, it's a good conversation. About. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. Okay, Ellen Burstein. Yeah. Or Burstein, I don't know. Burstein. I love this movie because one of the things I love most in life, period, is watching artists develop mm -hmm. and watching them achieve something greater than what they've been able to achieve before. Yeah. And I was just already on board with Darren Aronofsky yeah. because of Requiem for a Dream. Mm -hmm. And I didn't need anything else from him like that like added something meaningful to my cinematic language mm. and then he made the fountain and took all the suffering of requiem for a dream and just put it next to a transcendent ideal of like acceptance and creativity and life and yeah. divinity and so so much carried over into the making of the fountain Okay. Um, the same like editing tricks and the same like tactile physicality, like the sequence of him creating ink in his spaceship yeah. to tattoo himself mm -hmm. and like boiling things mm -hmm. and mixing things. And I was thinking about that with the Inquisitor like smearing blood and then the ink that gets spilled on the nightstand and then the like liquid from the tree of life itself like yeah all of that <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right so it's all the same substance yeah. that's being used yeah that's interesting um that specific sequence where he's a space traveler making ink is a direct use of an editing technique he uh innovated in requiem for a dream wait can you say for the, it's all the same substance that's being used? You want me to get into that? Yeah. It's the life blood. Mm -hmm. um, he literally has to take some of the tree off. No, does he? Yeah. What to make the ink? Mm -hmm. Does he have to use some of the tree itself? Mm -hmm. I don't think there are any liquids in the film. Except for those, Except yeah. the ink mm -hmm. bottle that smashes when he's mourning mm -hmm. his dead wife and the ink he makes in the spaceship and the blood that the head and high inquisitor uh, smears all of Spain yes. with. Yeah. The spirit of, the animating spirit of existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, sorry to interrupt. So you were talking about the cuts. A, a, talking about the really fast, really physical minutia editing. That's mm -hmm. just a celebration of craft and hands-on like crafting things mm -hmm. by like these quick cuts really close up to small objects um, to make some human ingenuity. Yeah. And uh, in Requiem for a Dream, it's these heroin addicts and all the little things they make to fill a syringe and get high. Oh, interesting. And it's it's like it's like pop art. Like it's like 
cut, 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 cut. Mm -hmm. it, it's like that, almost that fast with like different sounds and sparks and like fizzes and stuff and, yeah. and gasps of human breath mm -hmm. uh, to uh, sh like show a like a love of a craft. And so like he made that way of mm -hmm. cinematically developing that with this basically dark, destructive thing, and then just carried it over to a much more life-giving movie. And um, Alan Burstein is in Requiem for a Dream as one of the tragic figures that falls from her dream into really? this very dark place. Interesting. She, uh, she grasps, she thinks she's found her treasure and in, in the grasping of it, she's like denying experience mm -hmm. and she like goes through this horror show of this like spiraling descent mm -hmm. into madness. I'm pulling this out of my ass, but I feel like she got nominated for an Oscar or something. For Requiem? For Requiem for a Dream. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's... Uh, Should we look it up or no? It's harrowing mm -hmm. watching her go through this, and she's she's a, and she like has a lot of weight at the beginning of the film, and is a twig mm -hmm. at the end of the film. Wow! Like she, this is like Hugh Jackman in The Fountain. Ellen Burstyn put everything yeah. into Requiem for a Dream. Like wow. I don't know when she was like a young starlet and what kind of work she did back in the day, but like, it seems to me that like Requiem for a Dream is probably one of her crowning artistic achievements. Mm -hmm. And she's carried over into this film and she's this enlightened, yeah. grounded uh, voice of wisdom yeah. and understanding mm -hmm. that can mediate between the lovers yeah. when they're having disputes. Mm -hmm. Like she can talk to the doctor in his mm -hmm. darkest moments yeah. and she can talk to the dying wife in her most enlightened moments. Mm -hmm. And the way she's lit and the way she carries herself in the movie, she's at peace with herself. Yeah. And that's this like, you, as an audience member, you just, it, who's only seen Requiem for a Dream, and then the fountain comes out into theaters, like, yeah, that's the heroine from the last film. Like, she already won. So mm -hmm. she's, like, stepping back and just in the background helping mm -hmm. other people yeah. go through this heroic yeah. process. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. And that's what's beautiful about the fountain itself is Aronofsky going through a really dark place and then oh, yeah <laughs> and then like making alchemy out of it like mm -hmm. I felt like I was seeing alchemy happen with the fountain yeah I mean yeah like literally <laughs> literally it's like this like black and gold yeah beautiful mm -hmm.